John Seidlitz, welcome back to Highest Aspirations. It has been a while. Okay, the se seven steps to a language rich interactive classroom was a, an approach to uh, developing language in academic core content area classrooms like math, science, language arts, English. We were thinking about, we started off with questions like, well, what would be some easy wins that could get buy-in? And then we started thinking, is there an approach where we could get a language rich classroom for these teachers where language which we meant there'd be listening, speaking, reading, and writing about academic content aligned to standards that was at a high level and consistently throughout the classroom. Is there some things that we could do that could get that in classrooms that somebody who doesn't speak ELLEs or mm -hmm. language acquisition E's could kind of quickly start doing things and see some wins. And so it took us a while to get there because we would we, they'd love it at the training and we would do trainings and they'd say, this is so wonderful. We just loved it. They give you on a scale of one to 10, it's a 10 on everything. And they would tell, we love you, John. We love you, Bill. Please come back and do this again. <laughs> but uh, they, we'd go into classrooms to observe and they were not implementing. So we'd get them back together in a little focus group and say, why weren't you doing this? What was the problem? They say, well, it worked with the, us at the workshop, but it doesn't work with the kids. Yeah. And so we started backloading. If you actually look at the original book, you see the activities there. That's what we started with, were those high level engaging activities. And then we started backloading and say, what were the skills they needed to have those kind of rich dialogues in classrooms? And eventually we played around and played around and we got what we now call the seven steps to a language rich interactive classroom. And they're kind of a sequence of things starting with hyper easy to implement, really, really easy to do, which, and then teach kids what to say when they don't know what to say, what to say, in the, step one all the way to step seven, which is harder, which is structured reading and writing activities. And so we, we developed this approach to, to try to bridge the gap between what does research say is effective and what's happening with the teachers we work with. And then that was sort of the, the genesis of the seven steps. Well, one of the great things about this new edition um, is that you've included some research on how seven steps is working. It's been around for a while. You're able to collect some research and you've really invested in that. So we'll get into this specifically, but I'd love to hear kind of from your perspective, what are some key takeaways um, from that research uh, in, in terms of how it's working? Well, okay, the key takeaways of the research. Let me, let me describe a little bit about what we did and what, what we're doing with the research. And then yeah. I'll, I'll kind of talk about uh, some of the takeaways. Uh, we had in, in, in the first book, in each step, we talked about existing research about that step. That like, for example, one of the steps, uh, Step three is randomize and rotate responses. And there's a tremendous amount of research already in existence on the effects of randomization on participation. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had a step called total response signals and there was a lot of research on clickers and response cards. And there was a lot of stuff out there um, for each of the steps, structured conversations for all of them. In the first book we shared uh, uh, for each step individually, what was the existing research? What wasn't out there and what was not available to uh, folks who were implementing was how does this thing all work as a system? What does it look like when we're implementing it in, in, both in a, in a classroom or on a campus? What does it look like when a teacher is doing all of these together? What does it look like? So we wanted to know the answer to that. And so we worked with outside, uh, we, we, we worked with an outside research firm to conduct you know, independent research on the uh, seven steps to look at what is it, how is it working? And we did a a phase study, and I can get into the phase study in a little bit. I just want to kind of give a big picture, but sure. we did a, 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 a three different phases where we're looking at uh, five different campuses. Uh, 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 all of them are, are in Texas, five different campuses in Texas where we looked at, uh, all of them are middle schools. So we're only looking at middle schools to kind of narrow our, our, our scope. We looked at uh, five different middle schools to say, what is the uh, effect on student performance on math, on reading and on telepaths? of teachers who were coached and trained, the students of teachers who were coached and trained in the seven steps. And so we and finished- so John, these are, sorry to interrupt. So these are, no. these are, so you you went from talking at the beginning about people kind of using disparate pieces of the seven steps. Now you're talking about people who, who have been trained and the idea is that they're using all of them as oh, a great. system. Right. Okay, great. Thanks, just exactly. want to clarify. And so so our phase one was just looking backwards. So we, we basically looked at uh, what, who were teachers who were, who were coached extensively and trained. And so we had a certain standard of like attendance, all that kind of stuff. We looked back and see teachers who were coached and trained at these uh, districts that we had a selection process for selecting. And then after we looked at the teachers who were coached and trained in the model, we said, how did those students 
perform compared to students who teach of teachers who were not coached and trained in math and reading and on the for English and uh, English learners on the English language uh, assessment that we have in Texas called the Tell Pass. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a great overview. Let's break that down a little bit. Um, you talked about performance uh, in I think you said math and ELA. Um, you you chose some schools. You make sure you made sure you noted the 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 teachers who were trained in that. What what I want to get into kind of what it said. What, what did it say about student performance um, in in content and language assessments? Do you have some data to talk about that? Well, we do. I, I think it's really interesting that you started with math because I think our I'll, I'll start there because that's where we actually ha saw the biggest effect size. And you mentioned that your wife's a math teacher. Yeah. And the biggest uh, uh, effect that we saw, the largest effect size, was actually mathematics. And so uh, in Texas, our uh, a content assessment is called the STAR. I know in different states, they have the park or whatever kind of mm -hmm. content assessment is called STAR. Uh, and overall, our math scores were significantly higher for treatment versus our control groups. Most treatment cohorts had significantly higher scale scores across all three years. So we looked at, at three different years. So some students, we only looked at their eighth grade because that was the first year that they were, teachers were trained. We had some that we got to look at sixth, seventh, and eighth. And basically we had, uh, but what we saw was that uh, the, all the treatment cohorts outperformed the uh, control groups. That means, let me kind of put that in, in more direct terms. Students of teachers who were trained and coached in the seven steps, uh, significantly outperformed students of teachers who were not trained and coached in the seven steps for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade on math. We also saw that the longer they were in the math classrooms, the longer that they were there, the higher the, uh, the larger the effect size was. And Got so, um, so the students who, who had three years of teachers who were coached and trained in the model had a larger effect size than students who only had one year. With, with, with teachers mm -hmm. as a rule. I mean, we're not saying every single student, but overall the effect size was larger of students who were in the program uh, who, who, who were with teachers who were coached and trained for a longer period of time. Is that surprising, math? A little, it wasn't what I expected, kind of. I mean, I, I would think uh, that tell pass, we would see big gains. And, and then I kind of thought for reading and actually the tell pass and the, which again is the English language assessment, mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, math gains were much larger than reading. At one grade level, I don't have it at the tip of my thing. I believe it was seventh grade. We saw uh, the smallest effect size of everything of all three grade levels, which was uh, it still had an, an, an effect, but it was the smallest was seventh grade reading. And I, I kind of have a theory about that I could talk about, it, but it's not what I know. But I have a guess. Um, my, and, and you've done training in step development too. So you, you, and you, you, you taught in middle school, right? Or were you at high school? Steve? High school, high school. Yeah. Or high school. Okay. So when we go to trainings, uh, I want to think through how I put this and does it make sense? Um, math teachers are sometimes the easiest sell on academic language. And, and it's the strangest thing about lay effect because when I talk with math teachers, uh, when I see teachers at the training and I talk about why do you think the students aren't, aren't performing well in an assessment? Is it because they don't know the math? And I'm talking about English language, I don't want to say students in general, because we only looked at English language learners. Sure, yep. We could do some follow-up data on other kids, but we looked at, at uh, students who were coded as uh, EL. Uh, now we, in Texas, we changed our, our classification. We now call them uh, uh, we, uh, emergent bilinguals. Right. Um, but at the time of the research, they were called English learners in Texas. And so we only looked at them, but when, when I talked to them about, say, what, think about your English learners, picture an English learner in your class. They often recount a student who was successful at math, who struggled with the language of the assessment, mm -hmm. or kids who they know how to do the algorithm, or they understand, they might even be able to set up a problem, they may even be able to draw a picture of it, but aren't successful in the assessment. And I, when I talk about the need to use academic language, to use, uh, let me be more specific, to use content specific, complex right. content specific language, because I think the term academic language can kind of be loaded sometimes, but I mean, content specific language of the math classroom, yep. when they understand that that is a barrier to, to successful performance in the assessment. And that if I can have kids practicing using math language, the language of the discipline, as it appears 
in the texts and in assessments and in academic or, or math conversations, then we can have them be successful in that assessment. So um, it was a little bit of a surprise on one hand, because I was, I was pleasantly surprised because I'm definitely presenting this when we talk to math teachers, but it also was in a way kind of like, okay, that made some kind of a sense. Uh, I have a theory about reading too, why our reading, why reading had the least gains of the three and you want to know what it is? I do, but before I before I get before you get into that, sure. I, I I I kind of asked you that question as a bit of a setup. I I'm I'm actually not surprised by that. I, I think and I think you explained it really, really well because that barrier to entry is that and I like it how you're specifically calling it the content language that students need for math. Um and, and having that vocabulary to be able to perform and to show what they know. I mean, that's kind of the bit the a, a big part of it. And you look at some of the research it shows that these as, as math shifts over to kind of more word problem, uh, language based, um, you know, challenges, that's, that's, uh, I think that's really good news, actually, that, uh, that, that, that seven steps and probably other strategies as well that are, that are front loading academic language or teaching the students content language that they need to know um, is successful. So anyway, I'm glad you got into that. I do want to hear the theory about reading. Well, I, yeah, just, just to kind of follow up on what you said about the, the, the approaches, I do think that it's kind of like the messages out there in, the, in the, the academic world among teachers and teacher specialists and, and leaders that the, 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 the language used on assessments and in texts of a particular discipline, that kids need to have access to that. And that it needs to be used in listening, speaking, reading and writing throughout instruction. And then that's a big piece of the puzzle. And uh, math teachers, I just don't ever have resistance to that when I'm talking with them. Yeah. The thing on reading, it's a couple of things. One is when I look at the actual steps, and this is my, my own belief is that I think we've talked about this before, Steve, not in a podcast, but we've had this conversation before. I am a big advocate of independent reading and free voluntary reading. Mm -hmm. And I did some, I, we did, we did, I do work with schools on that, on establishing those programs and uh, every, on how do you do that and using like Pilgreen and Pilgreen or Marzano in the, in the, in, in classroom instruction at works, he lays out some of the, the uh, element or building academic background. I'm sorry. He lays out some of the elements of a high quality program. Uh, of free of structured free voluntary reading. That's not a part of the seven steps. Uh, the academic reading kids are going to get is going to be during class short bursts of academic text. That's that's the kind of reading they're going to get. They don't. We don't emphasize when working with a campus what goes on outside of of class or stuff like Donna Miller with a where your Donna Miller was that what's the name of her book the one about uh, the book book whisperer book whisperer. Yep. Yep. Before, where you're getting kids hooked in and addicted to reading and just reading, 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 reading. Like one of the things Carol Salva, uh, the author of Boosting Achievement for English Learners, mm -hmm. one of her things was get the kids reading constantly. You're reading on the bus, you're reading in the cafeteria, you're reading constantly, and she sees these big reading gains. It's not a big part of our model. Yep. So the increases in reading kids are gonna get is gonna be the reading they're doing during class reading academic texts. I do think it helps. We did have modest effect size, but I don't think the seven steps as it's, uh, as we implement it with teachers, it's about the conversation, the reading and writing that happens during classroom instruction. And I think it's necessary to improve that, but I'm not sure it's sufficient to get really big gains in, in reading that you get when kids are, are a part of a program where they just do massive amounts of both independent, self-selected and teacher-selected academic and uh, uh, self-selected reading. Yeah, but like anything else, and this is, I think, good of you to say, uh, seven steps is part of a, you know, larger picture, right? It's it's part of an ecosystem, and within that ecosystem, hopefully, exists the, um, the 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 drive to get students to read anytime they can. Um, it's a part of what you're doing, but it's not the only part. So it's interesting, but I think that's a really like that comparison between reading and math. Um, it's kind of thought provoking, right? It gets us to think about what what yeah. students need in those, particularly in those in those STEM classes. And it's also nice to hear. I think that's a shift. I mean, over the last 20, 30 years, maybe of the math teacher really, really not needing a whole lot of buy-in to understand or to to buy into the idea that yes, academic language is extremely important or content language is extremely important with math. May not have been the case um, 20 years ago. It's true. Now, I don't want to minimize that we had gains in reading. We did have gains in reading, and they were they were some of them were were kind of big. Like our eighth graders uh, had the highest scaled average over the control group of twenty three points, and our our cohort one, which was the one that had we scored over uh, three years, had the highest margin of nineteen points 
over the control group over all three years. So that's a yeah. huge yeah. difference that we had in reading. But so we had a big gains in reading, but they weren't these the 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 they were not as significant as the gains that we saw in the students of, of the of the teachers who were using the model in math classrooms. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we just talked about is really the most important part, which is how students are um, uh, are actually using, or I'm sorry, how teachers are using the seven steps to have positive impact on students. I want to back up a little bit, though, and talk a little bit about what, and one of your research questions was, what do teachers and administrators think about the use of seven steps in their schools? And that's obviously important for buy-in and implementation and everything else. What did you find uh, on that? Well, it's interesting that you're asking that. We're, we're, we're conducting focus groups and surveys right now. So we don't have the uh, published data on this yet, but I can give you preliminary Sneak uh, peek. conversations that we're having too. And we're actually looking at uh, doing a, a few articles. One of them is gonna be kind of, uh, we're looking to publish something on the overall uh, impressions of the seven steps, but specifically the pandemic. And we were, in the middle of the study, we had this big pandemic <laughs> thing that we all went through and we shifted to online. And uh, so when we're having these focus groups, we're talking, we're asking questions about like before the of teachers and administrators before the pandemic and during the pandemic, what did you see? And so I, I can tell you some of the things that I'm hearing sort of anecdotally and from participating in this dialogue that we're having with sure. the teachers right now. And it, it, there is a definite sense of ease of implementation in a traditional classroom that there's a refreshingness of, oh, this wasn't too hard to do. There's very few teachers that we get, uh, this was really, really difficult, or it was really, really challenging, or it was impossible. There's a few specific things in the model. I think uh, a QSSA, which was the subject of the other podcast mm -hmm, I did, mm -hmm. um, that teachers, uh, it takes more than a single attempt to try to get it in place. And then the uh, activities, the, the kind of the, the perspective, multiple perspective activities in the back. Some teachers talk about uh, trying and failing a few times, failing upwards on sure. those. But we don't get a sense of, I, what is this? This is overwhelming. I, I don't understand this. I, I really don't. I, what are we trying to do? We, don't, we didn't get a lot. We didn't, we're not getting a lot of that in the dialogue with teachers. What we did from administrators, uh, what we do here is that they see uh, different levels of, of uh, implementation in different classrooms. And what we're seeing now, we're in phase two now. Phase one, we just looked at trained versus not trained, trained and coached versus not trained and coached. Yep. Now we're looking kind of at the micro specific. And what we're seeing right now is teachers can pick and choose, but that's a good way to put it, right? Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Pick and choose, but you can pick and choose certain things and you get a kind of an, uh, you get a, you'll, you'll, you'll see an effect on, on student learning. But what we're seeing is that when teachers do it as a system and they do the whole thing so that there's listening, speaking, and reading and writing in a structured way throughout the lesson, you get a much larger effect. Is that why, what you, is the reason why that's the case, what you just said, because there's listening, reading, writing, and speaking within a specific lesson every time and that's cycling around, or is there more to it than that? And I guess this is an opinion question. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you pin this down, but you've done Mike it a long is, time. That's just it. It really, really is. Uh, that when you listen, speak, read, and write, and you're checking for understanding throughout the lesson, because I could be listening, speak. Here's the thing. Let's suppose somebody does a lot of, of think, pair, share. Yep. But there's skipping step four, which is the total response signals throughout the lesson. Well, then I could be doing a lot of really high quality listening, speaking, reading, and writing with a third of the class, or even worse, with a fourth of the class. Yep, yep. And so it's one of those things that, like, I will get an effect size from doing that because those kids will, will, will improve who are participating in that. And that's going to show up on the data, which probably showed up in our phase one data. But if I'm doing that with everybody, by checking for understanding throughout the lesson using those total response signals, then I'm gonna see a, an, uh, a larger improve because I'm moving everybody up, not just the kids who are participating, who are volunteers. We could reverse that too. Let's suppose I'm doing total response signals in the lesson. So I am constantly checking for understanding, doing thumbs up, thumbs down, response cards, clickers, whatever it is. I'm checking for understanding throughout the lesson frequently. So I've got the kids with me throughout and there's a high level of engagement but there's no writing and there's not opportunities to read academic text in every lesson. Well, I'm going to get improvement from that. We already knew that going in. You get an improvement from any of those are going to increase your 
you're, you're, you're going to get an improvement. But when you do this as a system, you're going to get more. I just put those two there as an example, but really overall, when it, what we're, what we're seeing right now with what, with the data we're looking at right now, our preliminary phase two data is that it does make a difference. Um, the intuition of the principles, because that was your question about, uh-huh. they see it, that they do see this difference that they're seeing. It does make a real difference in student performance and the teachers that are doing all of it really have it, which, uh, which was the hard part about the pandemic. If we want to get back to talking about some of the things that we heard from the teachers about that as well. Sure. Yeah. And it's hard to do all those things during a pandemic when you're trying to figure out how you do anything, you know, I mean, it's hard. It must be really difficult to do. I mean, what I'm taking from everything that you're saying is, and again, this is kind of like going back to my teaching days, you know, we all have our favorite things to do and, and our favorite things to do are generally successful. And if they're successful, they make us feel good as teachers. We see the feedback yeah. and we'll do more of that. Right. Um, but then we can get caught in a, in a, yeah, in a yeah, so so we have to make sure that we're um, that we're using tools and strategies that maybe are a little bit out of our comfort zone. Um, but you've created the structure where you could do this kind of in a safe's not the right way, but in a structured way that makes sense. But there's also, I mean, I've never implemented it, right? I've read the book, but it was I read it after I was teaching. Um, but it seems like there's enough agency there as a teacher, right? Where you're not you're not like following a recipe so that you can get these results. Um, to the T, you're able to kind of have some flexibility and agency there. And that's one thing that I'm curious about is a bit of a curveball question, but like as teachers go through this and they're implementing the entire thing at once to get kind of the most benefit out of it, um, how, how much how much flexibility do, do they have and how, how important is that to them and their students that they can kind of maintain their sort of teaching style and their, and their even their relationships with their students? That is a really, really good question. And it's something I struggled with. I remember early on, I was doing a training in Austin. This is before the first book came out. This, this was 2010. And a teacher said, <laughs> they use kind of a strong term. They said, I don't know when I tell everybody, raise everybody raise your hand and everybody raise your hand and don't put your hand down until you can finish this question. I feel like I'm some kind of a fascist, he said. It was like, <laughs> we were in Austin, you know, and he was like, he was a student, just got out of UT. I went to UT myself. I said, I don't think you're a fascist man. You're trying to include everybody in the conversation, but we had this dialogue, but I understood what he was saying about, are we all cookie cutters? Are are we getting a cookie cutter teacher where everybody's doing the same thing? And what I discovered was uh, it it doesn't look like that in implementation. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, There are very, very in the box, traditional ways to do seven steps where somebody is not enthusiastic or bubbly or silly or goofy with their response signals and their structured conversations. Uh, you can do cube triple essay like this. And I, you know, I'm, I'm in, a, in an AP class in a high school and I say, okay, everybody go ahead and write your thoughts down. And as soon as you've on, on this question, I have an open-ended question. You've got a stem up there, write your response to this question. And as soon as you finish, put your pencil down. Okay, so you guys have your, have your groups, your discussion groups. Uh, go ahead and talk about this in your discussion groups. And when you finish, I'm gonna randomly select somebody to respond. And that's, that's a QSSA. And, but you're not saying everybody stand up. Okay, sit down when you're ready. I mean, that's more like what I might do with a sixth or seventh grader. Even sure. an eighth grader. Um, I'm probably not gonna do a reverse hand raise with uh, sophomores in high school. And I might, I mean, I don't know. There's probably some teacher out there that's like, I do that with my kids and it works fine. You know? but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it doesn't have to be. I've seen teachers that are really in the box. The trick is, if kids are listening, speaking, reading and writing and being checked for understanding in a way that they're safe so they're, they're not afraid to not know throughout the lesson, then you've got, you're gonna get that kind of improvement that we see in academic discourse in a classroom. Right. Um, I don't think the seven steps is the only recipe for this. It, it absolutely is not. I mentioned PSYOP earlier, which is a, a research-based highly effective model for implementing, especially with the English learners to improve instruction. There's GLAD, there's QTEL. I don't think there's, I don't, I, I, I'm just not a believer that there's one way of doing this or that we found a magic bullet. I do think we found a way an approach to increasing listening, speaking, reading, and writing that will help on assessment. I, you know, there's something else. Like, can I throw in just another thing that just isn't related? Yeah. And then remind me about assessment because I want to get into that in a second. Okay. So I think that English language acquisition is is necessary, but it's not always sufficient to get improvement. And I think we can forget that. I, I've 
we've seen sometimes uh, when I worked with camp, this wasn't a part of the research, but I've worked with campuses where they've seen improvement in English language acquisition for English language learners, mm -hmm. but not seen improvement on assessment. Like for social studies was one specific example. So I find out that the instruction didn't really align with the assessment. Yep. They were teaching kind of their own kind of thing. They, you know, their own, it was a very creative, fun classroom where all the kids were engaged, but it didn't match what they were being assessed on. Right. And so that's one example. Or you could have a lot of engagement, a lot of dialogue, but if it's not creating deep understanding about the content, then there's going to be gaps. That's one of the reasons why we kind of, in the new edition, we tweaked some things like to, step it up we added the section for each of the steps step it up which involves the kids in higher level thinking about content uh, about each step because it's not just the engagement or the language acquisition uh there's other pieces that are also necessary teachers relationship with their kids right are, do they feel safe am i being sarcastic with them and how am i relating with my students there's, there's other things that are also a piece of the puzzle yeah, I'm glad we're talking about this because it's a holistic way to to look at this, right? And and um, you have to give teachers the ability to get to know their students and the, their students the ability to get to know them, and they need to be themselves, or otherwise, students, particularly high school students, in my experience, see right through that, right? So, exactly. Yes. Um, I'm glad we kind of took that that little detour. I want to get back though to like the fidelity of implementation of the seven steps and using the whole system as opposed to parts of it, and how that's had uh, better outcomes. What, what, and we just, I just asked you to remind me about assessments, but I'm going to remind myself. Um, in, in Texas, we're talking telepass, right? Um, we can compare that to the WIDA's access or ELPA 21 or whatever the case may be. Um, how does the fidelity of implementation um, affect standardized assessments? What have you seen um, so far? Well, the fidelity question is interesting because we have three different phases of our study. We have the backwards question which was our phase one, which was teachers who were just students of teachers, coaches, and trained. Our phase two that we're doing right now. So you're doing it now. So it's, yeah. So I'm kind of asking you an unfair question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I can say that our preliminary data we have now, unpublished preliminary data shows that that fidelity really does make a difference. I, there's something I don't like about the word fidelity because uh, maybe this is unfair, but it kind of gets to your cookie cutter question that you were saying before. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to, for one thing, I, we have, I have seen in my own like work with teachers and also in uh, just some of the data that we're collecting now that you don't have to do all of it to get an effect size. You can get, I mean, to, I'm sorry, not effect size. You don't have to do all of it to get an effect in a classroom. You can get an effect, a, a change in student performance by doing two or three of these steps. You really, really can. But we, we are seeing that when teachers do the whole thing together because I think about when Bill and I were putting this together what we were trying to do was create a system where teachers could easily do high level conversations and writing with kids who were at varying levels of English language proficiency and background knowledge so how do you do that well you've got to do the checks for understanding you've got to set up the conversations with sentence stems you have to make sure they have some background knowledge you've got to you have to structure this so the kids are safe if they don't know saying can I please get more information all those pieces they work together to be able to do those activities that are in the book. And I feel like, I don't just feel like, I, my experience has been that when you're not doing all of it, you're not able to do that kind of high level discussions and writing and reading that includes everybody. You're, you're, you're doing that, but it's with a slice of the class or it's not as deep a level. So, yeah. so it's like, sorry to interrupt, it's like where you were talking about before. Something. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're missing some pieces. I did want to talk about though. You, you mentioned the uh, uh, WIDA and in Texas we we uh, we have the ELPS and they have access and in a lot of states and we have Telpass, which is our English language assessment. And we did find that that the students that there was a significant difference in listening, speaking, reading, and writing on all four domains. We saw all levels of students who participated. Uh, teachers who were coached and trained, but our, and I was really, really uh, glad to see that because the Telpass assessment in Texas assesses kind of a content area writing, so that they're given a, a content area writing piece to to write about on the assessment. And we really pushed in every class; kids need to be writing every day. But the math teachers aren't always assessing that writing. 
They're not right. always assessing it by going through. They're not looking forward to seeing, are you using a, a predicate noun appropriately? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are you using transition words? Or they don't do sentence combining with mass sentences. It's more reflective writing about what they're learning or process writing they're sharing with other, other students. It's often graded on, if as far as graded goes or assessed, it's on uh, completion or conceptual pieces, but not on the uh, structure of language. Oftentimes it's on using vocabulary. We encourage them to do stuff where they, you know, write, write sentences, include the following in your paragraph, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But in our math classes, uh, and, you know, we, we, did, we did not stress for them uh, to assess the way an ESL pullout teacher might assess or the way a language arts teacher would. And yet we still saw the gains. And I, I'm really, really, that was very, a, a hypothesis that I had for a long time was that we don't have to have content area teachers uh, overly assess the language production right. that you would get because they're reading academic text, or let me say they're reading content area texts followed immediately by content area writing that will spill over into the writing. And because they're sharing that writing with each other, that teachers don't have to, you're not going to turn a math teacher into somebody who's going to take home a stack of writing papers. Mm -hmm. to, you know what? That's not going to happen when you have 120 kids. Right. You know, that's a really, really good kind of realistic uh, down to earth point that you just made, because there is this expression that we hear all the time that every teacher is a teacher of language. And while that is the gold standard, and while it is something that I think the seven steps is definitely uh, allowing teachers to do in a pro uh, more structured, uh, organized, effective way, uh, we can't, I don't think, uh, and this may sound controversial to some people, we can't make a math teacher who's been teaching math for 25 years and all of a sudden is faced with working with students that, that they've never worked with before, we can't make them be uh, somebody who's going to grade papers. I mean, it's just not realistic. So striking that balance and, and talking about what we just yeah. that's a that's a breath of fresh air for a lot of people that I think that just heard that. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to overstate it and say thou shalt not assess language in a math class or that of course. there's co-teaching uh, that uh, uh, we have a, we're science education is publishing a book in the fall on uh, portraits of collaboration with uh, Maria Dove and Andrea Honigsfeld about, they'd be great people to get on your podcast if you haven't had them. They've yet. been on, I've had them on before. Oh, good, that's uh, cool. But they can come on again if they're listening. <laughs> but they, uh, uh, it's just some, some teachers who've done this collaboration piece. And I think when you're, when you're co-teaching is a great opportunity for a language teacher and a content teacher for the language teacher to do the assessment of the, of yeah. the, uh, right, of the, of the writing. But we know from things like about, uh, if the math teacher is, is assessing language, there's a lot involved in that. Yeah. There's a lot involved in that and knowing the phases of language acquisition and those kinds of things. And the, the theory was that if we could get the kids just frequently writing and, and frequent opportunities for writing with the, with, the, with the assessment, that that would have an effect on an assessment like the telepass, which does assess content area writing. Now, I, I want to add to that, though. The language arts teachers are assessing and their ESL teacher uh, was is assessing their writing so it's sure. not like they weren't getting any writing assessment but our methodology didn't really uh uh teach esl teachers how do you assess the writing assessments so our focus was on increasing the frequency and the uh i'd say comprehensibility because the writing is going to be shared and, and those the way the activities are written and done they're they are sharing it they are responsible for it there's those kinds of things but it wasn't something where they're going to have to go through and say this sentence needs to be more complex, add a transition word here, right? capitalization, punctuation, spelling, and those kinds of things. Yeah, there's a, there's a place in the educational ecosystem that, that is going to be taken care of, which again, we talked about a few, a few different times is that this isn't the only solution, right? It's embedded yeah. into a system that is functioning uh, well, um, kind of as a, as a whole. We so, also have campuses, you know, speaking of that, I, I don't want to drag this out too no, long. Go ahead. We have campuses that are using a model of sheltered instruction already so pretty successfully that have done seven steps with it and it just enhanced what they were already doing. Right. So we have campuses where they were doing GLAD, for example, and we've gone in and just done seven steps training. And I'm like, well, you're already doing GLAD or you're already doing this. It doesn't compete with what folks are doing. It just it kind of, it can enhance what, it can enhance an existing model of, sure. of uh, if somebody is doing something like a, a accountable talk, which isn't a sheltered model, but then this can kind of slide into that, or they're doing some other kind of campus initiative, writing across the curriculum. It doesn't have to be, it's not really a uh, comprehensive model of instruction, which includes lesson planning and all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Basically, while Seven Sips focuses on 
during classroom instruction, while the act of teaching is occurring, what am I doing? Well, I'm frequently assessing the conversations, providing scaffolding, and while the kids are listening, speaking, and reading and writing during that hour long, hour and a half long lesson. Yeah, that's helpful boiling it down that way. So I want to, there's so much more I want to ask you, but I want I want to keep it going here. I want, I'm interested to hear, you've talked about phase one and phase two. I know you have phase three planned. Um, and we talked a little bit about that last time. And I'd just love to just kind of give a preview. What, what's that going to do? What's happening there? Why are you excited about it? Okay, phase three, uh, we've already finished all the observation. We will have finished them by the end of March. We're not observing any more classrooms to see the fidelity of implementation of the teachers. Phase three, we're just going to track the kids over the next few years. So we've got kids who had three years in classrooms where teachers were using this uh, model of instruction. Now they're going to high school. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see how do those kids, how do they perform compared with their peers who were not in the seven steps classrooms and as they're going to high school and uh, seeing how they do on both uh, the language assessment, the telpass and how they do in math and reading. We may look at other things like attendance and graduation and those kinds of things as well. We, you know, we, we could go further than that and look at it, but our, our basic idea is to say, what was the effect, if any, of having three years or one year or two years of being in teachers who are trained in the model on math performance? And what's really cool is we can look at this now. We're going to have this kind of data where we can say, okay, so Jorge was for three years with teachers who were twos we had we our teachers are ranking zero one and two in their level of implementation right and so two would be a high the highest level mm -hmm. he's three years with with twos for math what effect did that have on his math assessment in ninth tenth and eleventh grade did he did he as compared to otherwise and so we're going to see does this have a long-term uh, effect on students which that's kind of exciting to me because it, it it leads to thinking about that this is not just about getting kids to do well on tests yeah and, and, and I think about it this way, Steve, like uh, I often say this to teachers, imagine a student comes to your class and they've been in a class for a year. They've been in classes where they've been required to think, I'm sorry, where they've been required to speak in complete sentences, write in complete sentences and frequently elaborate their thoughts out loud in class. This is just what they're used to. And you, you do an initial assessment like, uh, uh, okay, so uh, I don't know, not even an assessment, you're just having a dialogue. Uh, what do you remember about math class last year? And one first kid's like, I don't know. And the next kid's like, uh, we did like fractions, <laughs> you know, he gets somebody else. And he says, one, and this student, just because of the way they were trained from doing this for a whole year. One thing I remember about math class last year was that we learned how to uh, work with fractions. And so he actually said the same thing as the other kid. But if I'm the teacher looking at that kid and he, instead of saying fractions, he said, one thing I remember at math class last year was that we discussed how to work with, what's my impression of that student? This is a student who's engaged, who I'm excited to work with, you know, and, and it's not just the teacher, it's everybody in life. You're training yes. the student to make a good impression, which is crucial. And again, it's a little bit, it's one of those things where it's kind of taboo, right? Because as a teacher, you're supposed to, and, you, right. and we do, you look at the students for as to where they are and you get them to where you're going, but those impressions are important, right? They really, really are. And I, I think that what happens is when we're sending those kids out and they've gotten used to speaking in classroom this way, they just, it becomes a culture that they're used to and they get comfortable with it. We've moved an entire class or entire group of kids from being kids who aren't comfortable raising their hand to having their hand up all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. From not talking in class to talking in class. So that you're changing that culture. And then when the teachers see those kids, they're gonna have that different impression. There's so much research on that about teachers you know, the effects of teacher yeah. uh, attitudes on kids. So one of the things that happened to me, Steve, the year that I really implemented, we were doing the TESA model. I think I mentioned this last podcast, Teacher Effective Student Achievement, that came out of uh, research in California when I, when I was teaching in Floresville, developing this teaching methodology. We didn't call it the seven steps. But I started randomizing and rotating and using sentence stems with my students. And uh, I remember, like, the second six weeks, of the year when I really started doing this well, I didn't know who were the non-participators. I didn't know who were those kids who don't talk or who were those kids are, because everybody was, there was so much equity in the room. Yeah. I remembered uh, like uh, Mrs. Porter, my principal had some other people come in and come observe my classroom. Like I can't get him to do this in my class. And I, really? 
He doesn't participate. That's so yeah. strange. And I really see it now. I've got one of my, one of my, my, my sons, um, my 10 year old, he, uh, Ugh, I don't want to make teachers feel bad, but he was with a teacher one year and he didn't participate. He was really quiet and he's with the teacher another year. And he's, she tells me he's just talking all the time. He's really active. And I'm thinking, yeah. I'm what not sure it's him because he's really does not get quiet at home at all. He's, he's constantly talking. Yeah. But if he wasn't talking, there was a dynamic there. When you structure interactions and you, and I've heard this before from, uh, a bilingual director, Angel Torres, who's in McAllen, who used to be in McAllen ISD, used to say, without a system, inclusion is an illusion. Yeah. If I don't have a system in place to make sure everybody's talking, with that system in place, those kids participate, and then we get to, and then they, it actually changes how they see themselves and the teachers see them. So what I'm excited about is, do, are we just affecting kids like, okay, they did better on a test one year? I, honestly, that's a so what to me. <laughs> I mean, it's important, but are we really affecting how kids, does this really change how kids see themselves, you know, moving forward uh, yeah. in where they are? Uh, it, I think it can. I think it can. I've had kids when I was teaching school and I've seen kids that, that uh, they really, really changed. Well, we heard those kids when we did the podcast last time with those students who yeah. were. I was were just going to say that. They talked about being in, in Miss uh, uh, Broussard's class and how. One of those kids in particular, I remember him mentioning he, he didn't think of himself as a high achieving student. That right. wasn't, or, or the, the, I think she was from, from, from Mexico, the one girl who mentioned that she wasn't a, a great performing student there. And she got here, and because of her teachers and the way that she was treated and the way sure. Ms. Broussard encouraged her to participate, she saw herself as high achieving. And I believe she's taking AP classes now as a senior. Yeah. And, and, and worth mentioning, by the way, that those, those students admitted in, in front of a, a whole bunch of people who were listening that at the beginning of that class, they, they, they didn't really buy into it. They didn't really like what's going on. They were a little uncomfortable. Yeah. And she had to put in structures in place that she knew were going to function and work well for these kids. And, you know, it took time. But over time, they realized this is the right thing. And you see the product of it. And getting back to, to the, the, the original question is about, you know, phase three and what you hope to see. What you're going to see, uh, regardless of what the outcome is, and I think it's going to be positive, is you're going to see what we all need to see, which is what is the result of uh, a strategy of implementing a, 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 a specific structure, a, a professional development in some ways, everything. What is the result? Because I think what we, what, we, what we kind of fail sometimes to do, at least in my experience, is to go that deep, to understand yeah. not only what is the effect on test scores this year, next year, years in the future, but thinking about what you just said. Is this kid who is, you know, 22 years old now that's moving forward and, and going to get a job and have an interview, are they going to be able to approach that, for, make that first impression in a way that's going to allow them to be successful? And you mentioned Pam Brassar interviewed her recently, and she talks a lot about that, about the ability to, uh, I think it's cross the finish line the way she puts it, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. And it's like, it's, it's there's so much, and, and here we're, I have a problem with, I fully admit that I oftentimes have a problem with the research. I mentioned that earlier and how, it, how it, bridging the gap to research and practice is, is, is hard, it's very really? hard, but you're doing it. And I, and I think it's, it's taking those extra steps. And I know it's work. It's an investment. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the most, one of the things I was most excited about chatting with you about, because I think it's so, so important uh, for, for such a variety of reasons. So I also think we're radically open to it, not working. In, in the sense that like, we need to know that. I mean, I mentioned that, that I've already, we've already found that, that, that language acquisition is necessary, but not sufficient. You know, that there, if you know, curriculum is not aligned, but it may be that, that uh, things like the teacher-student relationship, cultural responsiveness, maybe you get to an environment that's, that's really where you're not respected and you're not treated well. And then that's enough to overcome, unfortunately, all these barriers, but we need to know that. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's important that uh, that whatever the answer is, we can still grow from that. I, I remember uh, Bono from U2, right? I'm dating myself, right? But he had done this research on Africa and poverty and working with governments. I mean, it was real deep stuff. And they were talking about it with, with a, I think it was with a UNHCR or something. I don't remember the organization with the UN. But if he really failed, this 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 thing he was involved in and in trying to really improve this situation and in, 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 I believe it was with, with some various countries he was working with in Africa. 
and and I remember this response was like, "Do you think it's a it's a bad thing? I won't do an Irish accent. I won't do you know <laughs> punish the listeners with that." But uh, he he basically said no because now we know that that doesn't work. Yeah. And we, and now we can try again, but we're not going to give up. Uh, we're going to keep working at this. Maybe this is a piece of the puzzle, but there's some other really important piece that we need to find. And so I, I see it all as a great conversation that like research and dialogue and your podcast, all of this is like a big, great conversation that we're all uh, contributing to, that everybody's got a, a gift or a place or a thing to contribute to this conversation about what we're doing with kids and with teachers and classrooms. And whether we, if we fail, we'll fail up. We'll yeah. figure out, hey, that didn't work. We got improvement for this time frame with this strategy, but it didn't have the effect we were looking for. So let's look at what factors are going to make a difference. Yeah, and I think one thing that I've learned from this conversation, you and I have spoken a lot over the years, and you know, I appreciate your, uh, you know, your your all your contributions to the field and all the conversations that we've had. But you know, what what I've learned from this conversation is uh, the journey. I mean, it's such a journey what you've done with this. You know, it's starting in the two yeah, thousands and going now, and, and really, but great, but great. investing in it no matter what, which I think is is phenomenal. Um, all right, so. Uh, Let's let's wrap it up. A couple more questions. Um, one is this is an easy one. Um, people want to buy the book, or they're interested in learning more about the work you're doing. Where where do they go? I, I think the easiest way to get the book is probably from Amazon. I mean, we'd love you to order directly from us. But <laughs> Amazon's the easiest place to get it from. I will link to it. What if they it's want to learn about all this good stuff you guys are doing in Sidelets Education? Seven steps to a language rich interactive classroom, and we're at sidelets.education.com. And if you type into Google Sidelets blog. Uh, the authors who uh, many of the authors contribute to the blog that that have published books with us, but also sometimes we have guest blogs and teachers who blog. Uh, those are probably two of the best ways to to three of the best ways is get the book from Amazon, but you can also look at sidelesseducation.com or our blog is a great way to keep up with us. Oh, Twitter too, Twitter. Yeah, I'm at. I'm trying to get better at this. I try to post pretty regularly now. Um, I'm at at John Sidelitz, uh you can find me uh, at John Sidelitz is another way to find, but to, to keep up with us. Great. And I'll just, uh, another shout out for the blog. We, we share uh, probably at least one of your resources almost every week in our community brief. They're really phenomenal. Um, and we've talked to a lot of folks this season in particular, a lot of people from, uh, from Sidelitz Education who have really contributed a lot to the field. So really good stuff there. One last question for you, John, and you're not allowed to talk about seven steps when I, when I ask you this question. <laughs> um, is there a book or a film or any other resource that's had an important influence to you either personally or professionally since we last talked? I think you gave us one for Q Triple S A, but I don't remember what it was. I, it was probably, I think it was Parker, I mentioned too, PSYOP and Parker Palmer's uh, Courage to Teach. That's right, Courage to Teach, I remember. Those two that are, but I don't want to say those again. So I'm going to yeah. say the book that's probably uh, most influenced my life. It's Beyond Education. It's called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl, F-R-A-N-K-L, is a Holocaust survivor. And I was in my 20s when I read that book. And I was very cynical. I got out of college. And I was like, you know, kind of had this uh, 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 little, like, uh, just everything, everything's, everything's terrible. Everything's awful. Sounds nothing's familiar. Gonna, nothing's going to help anything. You know, that kind of uh, just a deeply, deeply cynical view of the world. And I, I remember reading... Uh, and I was teaching. There's no way to teach kids. Yeah. Right? Right. When I was interviewed to teach, I was asked by uh, Jim Davidson, the vice principal at the high school. He says to me, uh, John, do you love kids? Do you love students? Do you love, did you, do, do, do you love them? And I was like, I don't. And inside <laughs> it was like, I have no idea. I haven't even been around them for a long time. What kind of question is that? I was really kind of like, but in my mind, I was like, I don't even remember how I responded, but I don't think it was a great answer. I think they were desperate for a social studies teacher and it was three days before school started. But yeah. I, I, I remember thinking, I don't. <laughs> I just yeah. didn't know them. And I wasn't that excited about teaching them. But Viktor Frankl's book affected me because I had been teaching, I guess, a year and a half, two years. And uh, I think I just found it at Barnes & Noble, just walking around and grabbed the book. And he was a Holocaust survivor. He lost his family in the Holocaust. And he writes about his observations as a... Uh, uh, psychiatrist, which was his profession. And then that's the first half of the book, which is rough read, as, as you can imagine. Um, but the second half of the book was about how do you find meaning in really difficult circumstances? And the way the book ends, I won't even tell you how it ends. The last page is amazing. And I read it, even if I feel down, I still read the last page of that book is so powerful. Um, 
And he, he basically uh, paints a picture of that, I think he calls it tragic optimism. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase he uses, tragic optimism, that in the midst of a lot of suffering and grief, how do you have hope and how do you construct meaning? And he says it's, he really says it's, it's love. It's you got, you have to love your, loving your work, your creative work, uh, the people in your life, your students, that if you can really get a great love, then it can overcome a lot of obstacles. And I, that's really, it's why I was eventually led to Parker Palmer because he felt that way about teaching. And We've gone through this pandemic and this tough stuff. I didn't mention, I think I told you, Steve, I taught Spanish for a week this year. This is a whole other story. Yep, yep. Out of school. <laughs> and it was like, I, I get back to that, 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 that wonderful uh, 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 perspective that he has in that book of, of Man's Search for Meaning. It's been in print since, I think, the 1950s when it was first published. You can still probably go find it at, at, uh, at uh, Barnes & Noble if there's still one in your town. <laughs> but it's, I, that's a book that's... Uh, profoundly affected me as a human being and as a teacher and it's it's really worth a read yeah you know um yeah well first of all i remember those days when you just walk around a bookstore and pick out a book that seems to have largely dissipated unfortunately I but i i appreciate you bringing that book up i've heard recently i was actually just looking for the name of a book and i couldn't seem to find it but um the happiness something i forget the name of it um but it's about it, it, no it's, it's not the happiness trap it's a different it's a different okay. one. Uh, I wish I had it. Anyway, it talks about the, the the author talks about PTSD, right, which is obviously a real thing. But they also talk about what happens when you grow after trauma, and it sounds like a familiar topic. And what's horrible, even worse about, it is that I'm actually reading the book, but it's on my Kindle, so I can't remember. I don't look at the book, so I can't remember the, <laughs> name the right. title. Uh, but it's really good. I think it's the Happiness Advantage, um, oh, a similar wow. similar idea. And there was a superintendent from California who actually recommended that book in the podcast but we'll link to that one that sounds great um that's not one that i've read so i'll look into that as well and with that john silas it has been uh, a pleasure it's always great to chat with you this uh this went a little longer than i thought but there was nothing in here i don't think that was not useful certainly to me i really enjoyed the conversation so i appreciate your time thank you steve i appreciate it